Hello, health champions. Today, we're going to talk about the top 10 signs your cortisol is too high. Now, cortisol is often called the stress hormone, and they're mentioned together so much that people think that stress and cortisol are the same thing. And that's not the whole picture, because stress is a much bigger picture. Stress is a neurological adaptation where your body shifts. So basically, if you're in a relaxed state called feed breed, and then you encounter something that your body finds dangerous, whether it's a real or imagined danger, now you get into the fight flight response. And now your body starts shifting priorities, starts shifting resources. So first of all, a few things happen is that your pupils dilate. So you can take in more light and see more of the danger that's going on. So pupils will dilate. Then your blood pressure will increase, your heart rate will increase, your muscles will tense up. And all of this is so that you can get ready for that fight flight, so that you can fight or run away. You're going to need more blood in the muscles, you're going to need tension in the muscles and so forth. And then your body also needs some fast emergency fuel. And this is where the cortisol comes in because cortisol is a hormone that its purpose is to raise blood sugar. So that's the fight flight response and that takes a lot of resources. So if we send more resources to the fight flight response, then all of the things that normally are handled by our feed breed or our relaxation response, like digestion are gonna go down. Our immune system is gonna go down. Our reproductive function is going to go down. Our healing and repair is going to go down. So we need to understand that if we truly understand this picture, digestion, immunity, cardiovascular disease, high blood pressure, etc., etc., then that pretty much encompasses all disease. There are very few things that wouldn't fit in to that picture. So if we were to do a video on stress, the signs of stress, they would include basically everything. And we could call that video 10,000 signs of stress. Now, don't worry, I'm not going to do that video. we would be here forever. But cortisol is a part of that. It's only the portion. It's a chemical messenger. It's a hormone that raises blood sugar primarily, but also has some other effects that we're going to talk about. And it's one hormone among several, and it is part of this stress response cascade. So in this video, we're not going to talk about the stress response as a whole. We're going to hone in on the specific things that have to do with cortisol. And sign number one is weight gain. And how does that come about? Especially around the abdominal area. So this is often called an apple-shaped weight gain. You can have a pear-shaped weight gain where you gain it mostly on the hips, or you can have a little bit all over. But if you gain it mostly around the middle in an apple shape, that is especially bad because that's because of visceral fat, intra-abdominal fat. And if the weight happens to be there specifically, it's usually associated with cortisol. And now it's not just fat, but it's associated with a lot of different diseases. And what happens with cortisol, we said that it raises blood sugar. If the purpose is to generate glucose. And there's different ways we're going to talk about. Uh, but when glucose goes up, then insulin goes up. And if this happens chronically, like you're chronically stressed, chronically high cortisol, now we get an increased level of insulin resistance. And if you have stubborn weight, then it could be that you've done a lot of different things, you're doing some exercise, you're doing some dietary changes, but if that cortisol is there to trigger insulin, then that could be the reason that that stubborn weight won't let go. And number two is blood sugar imbalances. We just said that the purpose of cortisol is to raise blood sugar. And that's because blood sugar is the emergency fuel. The body prefers 
to burn fat for the baseline for a nice steady energy supply. But if we need a little extra energy, like we're being chased by a wild animal, now we're going to need sugar so we can break that down. When we can't breathe fast enough to oxidize and burn that fat, we're going to need just a little buffer. And that's what the glucose is, the emergency fuel. But the problem with modern society is that our stresses are more mental. They're more imaginary. We don't have wild animals chasing after us. If we did, we would use up all that energy. So the body generates glucose, but we burn through it. When the stress is emotional, now we're not expending extra energy. We're just raising that blood sugar. So now that glucose goes up, that insulin goes up. And if that becomes chronic, now that can contribute to increased insulin resistance and type 2 diabetes. Now, this could be cortisol from stress or it could be a synthetic version called cortisone or corticosteroids so oftentimes when people are extremely stressed during a period of time or they go on a course of corticosteroids then that could be the thing that tips the scale it is rarely the thing by itself in addition to good genetics and a perfect diet that's going to cause diabetes. But if you're already heading that way, then it could very well tip the scale. Sign number three is that you might experience cravings or changes in appetite. So again, the purpose of cortisol is to raise blood sugar. But how does the body do that? So there's three different ways, basically. One is to break down glycogen. You have a little bit of carbohydrate stored in the liver and the muscles that you can start breaking down. That's one way. Second is to turn something else like glycerol or protein, amino acids, into glucose. So that's number two. But number three, that's the most powerful, is to eat some more carbs. And that's called cravings. And that's why there's a vending machine on every corner, in every building, in every school, in every gas station. And that's why they're loaded with nothing but sugar so that stressed people can go and get their fix. So the body is going to do all three of these. But even if you do the first two to some degree, you're very likely to still get some cravings for carbs and sugar. But there's one more type of cravings that we can develop. And that's because stress affects the adrenal glands. Whenever we have stress, the adrenals that sit on top of the kidney, they're the glands that have to produce the hormones. They have the workload, the burden of actually making the adrenaline and the cortisol, among other things. So when we're working the adrenals harder and having them do all this cortisol, then some other things can fall by the wayside. And as a result, we can lose some minerals in the process. And that's why a lot of times when people are stressed, they also crave salt and minerals. Number four is frequent infections. Are you one of those people who catch every cold and flu that comes around when it's cold and flu season? Or maybe you catch everything that your kids bring home. And a lot of people that start improving their health status, they notice that they may not catch everything that the kids bring home anymore. And this fits in with what I just drew on the glass there, that when our stress levels go up, we're using resources for other things. So our immunity takes a step back. So that stress response is about surviving in the moment, whereas the relaxation response and the immune system is about surviving long term. So surviving the moment, that's about identifying and defending yourself or fleeing from big stuff outside of you. Dangers that could kill you in a moment or threaten your survival. Whereas digestion and immune function and repair have to do with the really small stuff inside. And when it's about survival, the short-term survival always comes first, because if you don't survive this second, then there's no point in having a good immune system tomorrow. Number five is that women may find their menstrual period 
become erratic or go away altogether. And the reason is that the stress response starts at the level of brain and hypothalamus. And hypothalamus is your master regulator. So it tells basically all the other hormone organs what to do. And it releases something called corticotropin releasing hormone. And that's the start of the stress response that ends up the cortico sounds a lot like cortisol. And that's exactly what it is. And when the CRH goes up, then the gonadotropin releasing hormone goes down. So anything that has to do with stimulating the reproductive system is going to be inhibited by that stress response. And that also makes sense because if you're in a battle zone, if your body is perceiving, if your brain is perceiving that it's really dangerous, it's really stressful out here in the world, then it might say it's too dangerous to have a baby and reproduce right now. So we're just going to turn off that function until things get safer. Number six is something that a lot of people are concerned with, osteoporosis. So there's many, many different ways that cortisol affects this. Cortisol directly inhibits, turns off the osteoblasts, the cells that build bone, and they increase the activity of the osteoclasts that break down bone. So it's a double whammy there, but it comes, keeps going. It also decreases calcium absorption. Even if you're eating it, you can't use it as well. And it increases the excretion. So you get, you lose more calcium in the urine and even more the mechanism we just talked about for the menstrual period, for men this happens specifically when your corticotropin releasing hormone goes up, your gonadotropin releasing hormone goes down. And in men this is known as hypogonadism. So you can have a decreased function of your reproductive organ and this is associated with osteoporosis in men. Number seven is muscle weakness. And we're not just talking about a little bit of weakness, maybe temporary on one side. So in my office, for example, I, often, I test muscles and we find different ways of adjusting and, and turning them back on. But this type of muscle weakness, we're talking about a loss of muscle mass, something that goes on for years and years where the muscle actually goes away. And part of this mechanism is gluconeogenesis. When cortisol levels are high, we're looking to make sugar, blood sugar, and we increase the gluconeogenesis. But if this is chronic, then we're gonna get it from breaking down protein to some degree. It's not the only way, but if it happens long enough, there will be some protein breakdown. And just like we said before, the purpose is to generate emergency energy. But if you're not running from something, if you're just sitting at your desk and being tense, or if you're just sitting in traffic with white knuckles, you're having a stress response, but you're not expending the energy. So what happens now is you get a big belly and a flat butt. You're breaking down the muscles in your large muscle groups around your, your butt and your legs. So you get a flat butt, skinny legs, and you get a big belly because that extra glucose now turns right back into fat. And if there's cortisol in the equation, then it's typically gonna end up in the midsection. So this is just one more reason I talk so much about stress and why it's such a good idea to take it seriously. Number eight is easy bruising. If you hit something and you get a bruise almost every time, then that could be high cortisol because cortisol, like we just said, it breaks down protein in large muscle groups, but it also breaks down protein in connective tissue. So tissue becomes more fragile. So when you hit it, now you get some bleeding. And what about things like cortisone shots? Well, that's sort of the same thing. Cortisone and cortisol, it's the same stuff, except they inject it and it will reduce inflammation 
but it will also make tissue more fragile. So you want to be really careful with these cortisone shots. And if you feel desperate and you got to do it, then do it maybe once. Because if you do it over and over and over, chances are that these tissues they're injecting into will become more fragile and you increase your risk of future injury. Number nine is that high cortisol may slow down healing. And cortisol inhibits inflammation. And again, cortisol, corticosteroids, cortisone, it's all the same stuff. And the reason we took that cortisone shot was to inhibit inflammation. But inflammation is also really important. The body does it for a reason. The only time it becomes a problem is when it's out of balance. But that inflammation is the first step of healing, the first stage. And if we don't have that first stage, very often healing doesn't complete. So as a result, we can get poor wound healing and we might have slow recovery from various forms of injury, from cuts and scratches, or even from surgeries. Number 10 is insomnia, poor sleep. And this is becoming so common. I think 50% of everyone coming into the office has this as one of their main concerns. And there's something called a pineal gland. The name pineal comes from the name. It's shaped like a pine cone. It sits right at the back of the brainstem. And it makes a hormone called melatonin. And this melatonin regulates your sleep and wake cycle, your circadian rhythms. And when it's time for you to sleep, the pineal gland makes more melatonin and puts you to sleep. Then when it's time to wake up, then there are two things that are going to reverse the activity that's going to turn off that melatonin. And one is light. And that makes good sense. We're supposed to sleep when it's dark. When the light hits the eye, then that light stimulates various processes and turns off that melatonin. The other thing that turns off melatonin is cortisol. And that also makes sense because if you are sleeping in your cave and you have a tiger come in and growl, then you should wake up really, really fast. So that tiger triggers a stress response. That stress response triggers cortisol and that cortisol shuts off that melatonin like nothing else. So what are some of the solutions to this? Well, there are some lifestyle changes that you can make, obviously. I often recommend meditation because that's one of the strongest, most powerful ways to turn off that worrisome chatter that we all have running around in our heads as modern human beings. And meditation takes a while to learn, but I think it's well worth it. And we're going to talk about some other tools, but they're not instead of meditation. So there are these lifestyle changes you definitely want to incorporate anyway. Exercise is another one because if you play hard, you sleep better. And also exercise stimulates the brain. It activates the frontal lobe and the frontal lobe, the better the frontal lobe can fire and work, the better it can turn off that stress response. So here are two super powerful ways to reduce and control your stress. And one more way, obviously, I have been going on and on and on about how cortisol raises blood sugar. Well, if you stabilize blood sugar to start with by eating less sugar, less carbohydrate, more protein and fat, and getting your carbohydrate from leafy greens and non-starchy vegetables, now your blood sugar is going to be rock solid and stable. It's not going to fluctuate by more than a few points. And the need for cortisol goes way, way down. So this is something a lot of people don't understand. They know that it's stressed. They don't understand that unstable blood sugar is one of the most powerful forms of stress. So these lifestyle changes are something that you absolutely want to do. There is no substitute for it. However, there are some very powerful tools that you can add on to make life simpler. And one is called brain tap. It's something we use in the office a lot and we've seen some tremendous results. It's basically an induced meditation. You put the headset on, you play a recording for 15, 20 minutes 
and the blinking frequencies calms down your brain. So it gets you like halfway toward where you want to be and then you meditate and you get the rest of it. So this one works whether you have any skills or not. You can fall asleep and it does the job. But it's not instead of meditation because you still need to develop some internal skills in turning things off. But this does a tremendous job of getting you part of the way. The next thing is you want to support your adrenals. There is so much adrenal fatigue out there. And the supplement we use is called Drenamin. It is from Standard Process and has a lot of components. It's a whole food supplement and it has some things in it that you can't find in any other supplement on the market and that's why we use it. And if you have a problem with minerals, if you are stressed and your adrenals can't quite generate the hormones to hold on to and, and balance minerals properly, then you want to supplement those. And I made a powder, an electrolyte powder called Ulite just for that purpose. And I formulated it to be the most comprehensive electrolyte, but it's also sort of like a four in one supplement to take care of all those minerals. So if you want to check that out, I'll put some information down below for all of those things. If you enjoyed this video, you're going to love that one. And if you truly want to master health by understanding how the body really works, make sure you subscribe, hit that bell and turn on all the notifications so you never miss a life-saving video.